Sam was relaxing watching TV when he got a phone call from his girlfriend Ginny. She said in an excited voice, Hi Sam, it's me. I just finished an absolutely amazing game. Well, I'm not sure could you even call it a game. It's more of a surprise or an amazing prize or something like that. I have the choice to nominate someone close to me to experience the same thing. Trust me, you'll love it. They gave me the rules. All you need to do is go down to the bus stop across the street and under the seat, under a stone, will be an envelope with instructions to you go to a place called the Red Room. But I know it's kind of weird at the start. You get taken in a cab and are blindfolded, so you don't know where you are going exactly. I have to admit, I was totally freaked out at that stage, but when I got to the Red Room, Sam interrupted Jenny. Jenny, are you high or something? What is going on? What is the Red Room? Okay, in the envelope you will see a questionnaire. You just fill it out and then follow the instructions to get brought to this room, which is called the Red Room. It's kind of strange though, because the room is all white. There is no red in it. But I was asked about what was my favourite food, movies, books, etc. And the room was full of everything I love. And there are loads of shopping trolleys outside the room to me carry it. Trust me, you will absolutely love it. I'll show you what I have when I get home. Sam said, You're telling me that I can go there right now to the bus stop and fill the questionnaire. Ginny said, Yes, right now, because you don't know what time you're going to be collected. Sam said, Okay babe, I'm on it right now. I'll see you after this freaking weird surprise you're talking about. A few minutes later Sam walked to the bus stop and sure enough there was a stone with an envelope underneath. He knew he couldn't fill out the questionnaire at the bus stop as he needed something to lean on and he had no pin so he brought it back to his house and filled it out. He was asked to go to a quiet road near his house and get picked up outside a gate in an hour. He was there waiting and a car pulled up and a person with a face covered said, Welcome to the Red Room where your dreams become a reality. You don't have to pay one cent for loads of things you could only dream to afford to buy. There will be lots of more surprises waiting for you in the Red Room. Sam was shown into the car and blindfolded and a half hour later his blindfold was taken off in a white room. The white room was full of everything he loved. Games consoles, expensive TVs and lots more. He then heard a voice come out of a speaker that said, Hello and welcome to the Red Room. Thanks very much for accepting the offer to enter the Red Room. Everything you see was chosen from the answers to your questionnaire. So we surmise you are very happy with your gifts. You now have the honour to ring a friend and nominate them to enter the Red Room. Just simply tell us their location and we will give you a meeting point to then pick up their envelope. Sam said happily, I nominate my cousin Fred please, he lives just around the corner from me. The voice spoke again, perfect, all you need to do is call your friend using your cell phone and let him know about the game and tell him to look under the same place as you did by your bus stop. Sam was very happy to make the call and when he hung up he heard something from the wall. He wondered what it was. Then suddenly he heard gunshots and he was shot to bits. His blood splattered all over the white room and he wasn't alive to find out why the white room was called the Red Room.
Thanks for watching the Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content, then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. The boys in homeroom were talking about it. They were like the Hardy Boys, but there were three of them. They were always talking about some adventure they just had. They had even invited me a few times, but I was always too chicken. <laughs> One time, they jumped the fence at the quarry. Another time, they went to the old abandoned mall near the sealed-off freeway that no one used anymore. This time, they were talking about a cave. It wasn't far from my house, at least that's what Miles said. It was in the woods behind my backyard, about a half mile down. But it wasn't the cave they were talking about. Well, it was, and it wasn't. See, Miles said he had heard something there, and he couldn't stop thinking about it. He said a voice was calling him to go inside. The others thought maybe they heard something, but they couldn't be sure. Miles wanted to go in, but the others said no, and as much as they wanted to, they just hadn't come prepared. Mickey said that it looks like you'd easily get lost because it was so dark. But tonight they'd bring flashlights and one of the big, long dock line ropes Chris's dad had down at the boatyard. It was sturdy, and if they tied it to something outside the cave, it'd keep them from getting lost in there. They invited me. When I said yes, they all froze. You're going in first, then, Mickey said. That dumb, freckled smile and greaser hair always made me want to punch him. We all met up that night by my house around midnight. I followed them as they walked single file straight through the woods. It was easy enough to find the cave. Half mile down, just like Miles said. It looked like a big open mouth. Black inside and totally hollow. There's someone in there, Miles told me. I stared at it with the others expecting me to go in first. He said he wasn't trying to scare me, but he knew it was true. There was something in there. He had heard it himself. I nearly peed my pants just looking at it. I told them I couldn't do it. They laughed. Then Mickey tied the rope to a tree outside and told me to wait for them. He said if they hadn't come back in an hour, I should tell someone. So I sat there and guarded the rope. At first it went taut because they used it to help them go down the initial slope just past the mouth of the cave. Just after a minute or so, the rope went slack, and they called to me saying that they were going a bit deeper. I said okay, and I sat there in the woods. That was the scariest night of my life. Normally the woods would be the scariest part. I didn't even like looking at them from my bedroom window at night. Something about them always felt sinister, even during the day, to be honest. They never felt like nature usually does, but this time, it wasn't the towering trees or the whispering of the wind slithering through the leaves that terrified me. This time, it was the cave. From where I sat, it was just a wide opening, with darkness so thick it could even be a curtain. Someone could have been standing there staring at me, and I would have never known it. The sun woke me up. It was dawn. It had been five hours since they went into the cave. I moved to the entryway and screamed, but there was no answer. I told my mom everything, and she called the police. The policemen could hardly fit in the tunnels past the slope. They tried everything they could, but nothing worked. Two weeks later, the search was called off. I had nightmares pretty much every night for a year after that. On days I couldn't sleep, I would sit up, looking at the woods behind my house, waiting for them to come walking out. They never did, of course. I never heard a single thing about them. 
Some people even tried going into the caves to look for anything they could find, but they all said it was just too tight to get anywhere after the slope near the opening. By senior year, people were finally starting to forget. It was almost like it was an urban legend, like it hadn't really happened. I was okay with that. I wanted to forget. One night, I woke up to a knocking at my front door. It was still the middle of the night. I was so groggy, I wasn't sure I was even really awake or not. I followed the sound of the knocking all the way downstairs and opened the door. But there was no one there. Then, I heard the knocking again and realized it had been coming from behind me from the basement door. Now I was sure I was awake. And I was scared. Every few seconds, it would come again. Knock, knock, knock. I was scared to open it, but I was frozen there, too afraid to run. So I opened the door. Miles was walking down the stairs already. The light in the basement was off, so he was just barely visible. He turned back and looked at me. You have to come to the cave, he said. We're still down there. He turned to go back down. Just before he did, his eyes glistened yellow in the half-light. He walked into the dark and vanished. I tried to convince myself that it had been a dream, but something inside wouldn't let me believe it. After that, I couldn't stop thinking about it. What if it was true? What if they were still down there? Every time I closed my eyes, I saw the mouth of the cave, just like that night. It felt like all it wanted was for me to go inside. I kept thinking about the tunnels. What if there was one right beneath me as I saw in class? What if all three boys were only a few feet away from me, right beneath the surface? It would have been the easiest thing, just staying put, keeping to the surface. The risk was all below. Just knowing it was there, knowing I would never have an answer to what happened to those guys unless I went in. I found myself going in there one day, when it was still light out, with nothing but a flashlight in hand. I figured I'd just cross the threshold, look around for a second, and come back up. Maybe the pulling, the incessant thinking about it, would finally stop if I just went inside, just for a second. When I got there, it wasn't so scary, so I walked inside. The cave was wide, wider than I would have thought. It sloped down so that just after you had gone in, you were already too deep to see the opening behind you unless you looked up, which I did. The cave stretched on beneath me. It was steep, but not so much that it caused much concern. I figured if I was really desperate, I could climb back up pretty easily. So I slid down, following the beam of my light, down and down the wide open cave. Finally, I came to the edge of the slope. There was a drop only about seven feet down. I aimed my light. It seemed like a flat platform and a way to keep going straight. I could only see a foot or two into the corridor. The walls were full of rocks that stuck out. I could climb up if I wanted, so I sat on the ledge and pushed myself off, landing on the platform. Hello? I called at the edge of the corridor. My voice carried, bouncing off the walls and fading into the dark. 
the feeling that had brought me here didn't dissipate as I moved deeper into the cave. It was just the opposite. The feeling got more and more intense, like I was always right on the edge of finding out the mysteries of the cave. So I went into the corridor. It wasn't super wide, but not too narrow either. I had to turn to walk sideways and fit comfortably, but that was okay. Behind me, the light from outside was starting to fade. In front, there was only the yellow beam of my flashlight bounding against the rock, which got sharper and sharper as I walked on. By the time I reached the end of the corridor, they were sharp as knives. There was another slight slope down. Beyond that, I wasn't sure. My light couldn't reach. I slid down, but the slope was so smooth I almost slipped and fell. At the bottom, I turned my light back and saw the slope was just as big as the first one. Only it was steeper, and there was nothing to hold on to. I tried climbing back up, but even as I did, I knew there was no turning back. And as much as I wanted to leave, I still felt like it wasn't done. Just a little further, I thought. I was almost there. The tunnel ahead wasn't wide like the first. In fact, it was exactly as wide as I was. I pushed in, both my arms grazing the sides. Each step was tighter than the last. And worse yet, it was always going down. I realized that ever since I had entered the cave, I had been steadily moving deeper underground, always going down. I must have gone at least a quarter of a mile below the surface by now. There was no turning back. I just had to hope I would find something that the other boys didn't. The beam of my flashlight grew dim, but there wasn't much to see anyway because it got so thin ahead. The ceiling of the cave wall dipped down and my only option became simply to go with it until it got so thin that I was on my stomach. There wasn't enough room to pull myself forward by my arms, so I had to belly crawl one inch at a time. My right arm was fully extended out in front of me, the flashlight shaking as I moved. And still, the ground sloped down, always down, always deeper. Every moment that passed, I was farther from the surface. I thought the cave would have some logic to its passages, but I was wrong. There was no rhyme or reason for why the tunnels would turn right, or the ground would suddenly give way. And yet, no matter how narrow or awkward, there was always enough room for me to pass through like it had been made for human bodies to inhabit it. Made by something beyond comprehension. And then, just as my light was beginning to truly die out, the narrow passageway I had to push and struggle through, ripping my clothes and tearing my skin, finally opened up. I was elated. My lungs could fill again without the pain of jagged rocks scraping my ribs but the feeling didn't last. There was nothing ahead. No passage. But there was something below. Water. Black. Nearly invisible. I stepped in it, thinking it was a puddle. My foot sank down to my shins before I caught myself on the edge. First, I tried to go back the way I came but the protruding rocks cut into my stomach. They all faced toward me so that when I was moving toward them, they only scraped my skin, but now if I moved the other way, they would rip into me. There was no going back. I could stand here in the little pocket and die, or I could drop into that black hole in the ground and risk not only being stuck, but drowning at the same time. The water bubbled 
and I wondered if there was something beneath the surface. Something that had called me here. Called Miles here all that time ago. But then another thought struck me. This one, so horrible, I wished I could have taken it back as soon as I had it. The mouth of the cave. The long, twisting tunnels. The warmth of it against my skin. It all felt so... alive. What if it was? What if Miles hadn't been called by something in the cave? but by the cave itself. What if the water moves because it was still digesting their bones? My light finally went out, and I was left with nothing but a darkness so absolute, it too felt alive. Like there was someone standing so close to me, I couldn't see anything at all. Yellow eyes stared up from the black pool beneath me. They quickly sank into the depths. I stood there, frozen and trembling, my mind reeling. Had I really seen them? I don't know how long I stood there. Maybe an hour, maybe five. My joints were locking up, and the silence around me began to sound like voices. I would move, and my feet would scrape the ground, and I would realize just how quiet it had really been. The dread of my situation began to set in, and I made my decision. I would dive into the black pool. There was no other way. I closed my eyes, which had already filled with tears, and I took a deep breath. I jumped inside. As soon as I did, I knew there was no coming back up the same way. The tunnel was about five feet deep. Below, the space opened up into a vast black ocean. I hoped to reach the bottom so I could trudge along the floor to find the wall, but I only kept sinking. Beneath me, there was only emptiness. There was no floor. I could see nothing, of course. But to me, it felt infinite. Like I was slowly falling down an endless void. The air in my lungs pushed against my ribs, desperate to be let out. Then something swam past me. I, I couldn't tell what it was. A giant, ancient creature... A skeletal boy who now lived in the labyrinth? Or maybe it wasn't something separate and apart from the cave. Maybe it was a part of it, like a tendril or a pulsing vein. My lungs burned. I opened my mouth. The water rushed in. It flooded every part of me. I woke up choking. All at once, it felt so ridiculous. Of course it had been a dream. It had to be. Once I caught my breath again, I lay down, trying to calm myself. I watched the ceiling, and as I drifted off again, I could have sworn the pattern on the drywall began to swirl. It's been some time since the dream, though how long I can't really be sure. I've moved on from all of that. Even the town is only a memory to me now. I work in the city. I have lunch in the courtyard of one of those new, big glass buildings. Every night when I go to sleep, I stare at my ceiling and just before I fall asleep. Sometimes it feels like the world isn't right. It's hard to explain what I mean, but... Sometimes, as I'm going about my day, eating my lunch, sitting on the bus, watching the people on the other side of the window go about theirs, something feels off. 
the people around me are always pleasant and fine, but there's something not right about them. And sometimes when I'm alone, I wonder... I wonder if I'm still there. Still in that cave. Just sinking into nothingness. I wonder if all this time I've been there. I've been sinking. What if I never truly woke up? What if right now, I'm in the belly of some great beast that placates my mind while slowly, but surely, it devours me? Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Hello, my name is Jason. The night my life changed, I could sense something was wrong. I knew it was, from the smell of danger that was in the air. I knew there were people in my house. I could feel their presence. I tried to stay calm and relax, as if nothing was wrong, but I knew that I was in danger. I knew any moment that there would be a knock on my door. I couldn't hear speaking, I couldn't even hear breathing except my own, but I knew there were people in my house and that those people would bring me so much trouble, so much pain. Suppose I could leave now, just walk out that door, or run out that door. But wait, I hear something. Then I heard a knock on the door. There is no point in hiding from what is out to get me. I opened the door and saw a policeman. I was relieved. Then I pulled out my gun and shot the policeman, relieved that at least now I know I have a head start to leave this damn place. I got into my car and drove and drove, knowing I have to change my identity again. Those people I've shot in the head in my home would bring me so much trouble. I know they would. It's a shame I have to do it all again, somewhere else, make friends, throw a party, and kill them all. The rush, oh the rush of killing them, nothing compares to it. But why do the damn police have to always ruin me trying to enjoy my hobby? For watching the assassin rapper and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content Jake saw an ad online for a life coach with a guaranteed plan to make their life better in every single way. Jake thought it was just a load of marketing and advertising rubbish trying to sell an idea that clearly wouldn't work in any way. But he was hating his life so much he thought to himself what harm would it do? He made an appointment by sending an email, and he arrived in the office the next day. The man introduced himself. Hello Jake, nice to meet you. My name is Robert Sampson. I am very pleased and thankful that you chose to do my course. This is a plan that has been guaranteed to work. Just you wait and see. 
your life is going to take a huge turn for the better and you will be happier than you ever were. You will be happier than you ever imagined. All you need to do is relax and go with the flow of the plan and you will find that your life is absolutely amazing and you will finally be able to feel the power of now. You will be able to focus on what you love and who you love and be able to get rid of all the negative energy that is holding you back. The session lasted for about an hour. Within days Jake's life had started to get so much better, just like Robert had promised him. He was so happy. He met a new girlfriend called Brooke and they had a great day out in the carnival. The next day he went swimming, which he loved but recently hadn't the mind to go. A week later he even joined a band and became the lead singer, which he always dreamt of doing but didn't have the courage. If that wasn't enough, himself and his new girlfriend Brooke travelled to countries they had only dreamt of going to but now could afford because of the money that was rolling in from the band's success. Robert was very happy with the progress he was finally achieving. He hated the teething problems with his other subjects and that was a shame those very nice people looking for help only to wind up dead. He felt stupid that he didn't take into account they would die of hunger and thirst. But this was going to be different. He sorted that problem. These pots wouldn't let Jake die like the others who were plugged into the Digiverse created to them feel here and see a world that was beautiful and amazing. But these pods should be able to solve that problem. Jake doesn't know either about the Digiverse. He doesn't know he's in a pot. If he would, wouldn't he freak out? Of course. Robert looked into the pot at Jake wondering how his life in the Digiverse was going. Thanks for watching the Assassin Rapper and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content.